All right, good evening, everyone. Bershus Arach Sanya, Bershus Rabbi Engel, the Morida Asra and Congregation or Torah, our wonderful hosts once again for a Kolo program. I want to begin with a couple of words of thanks. <clears throat> in addition to the shul, we'd like to thank the ATT for being a partner in this uh, evening, in this process. Oh, shout out to Rabbi Luri just walking in. Uh, for those who do not know, Rabbi Luri is involved in many of the ATT's educational projects, so we're looking forward to continuing to partner and collaborate together. This is uh, Mir Hashem, the second part of our initial um, a phase of teaching as part of the Kolos partnership with the ATT, but you'll be seeing Emir Sashem future installments, so we're delighted to work together. Uh, thank you very much to Rabbi Linzer and Hillel Torah for working together with us, and Rabbi Samber and Ari Crown, and thank you to everyone for coming tonight. Uh, without this group, despite the uh, somewhat inclement, although relative to what we could have, it's really nothing. We appreciate that everybody took the time out to really focus on this important topic, one that's very important for us and for our children. And uh, the other thank you, really the primary thank you, goes to the Kolol as an entirety, as a as a as uh, an enterprise, you could say, uh, to Yitzi Matanki and to uh, our entire office team, including the uh, newly minted colleague, Eisenbach, who gets a special Mazel Tov. So we're very excited for her. Um, and that also means that if any, not, anybody knows an eminently qualified office manager, please let me know after the uh, program. Um, <laughs> but then, and finally, as everyone here hopefully does know, uh, within, in less than two weeks, Amir Tzashem on Sunday, the 28th of February, um, is the annual Kolo dinner, and we are recognizing three really outstanding couples, pillars of our community, uh, Rav Schwartz, Shalita, and his Rebetzin, as well as the Hobermans, members of Ortora, and our alumni of the year, Rabbi and Mrs. Rosenbaum. So it's a special event for us. It enables us to do all the things that we do, including this program. And I'm honored to say that as I look around the room, many of the people in this room currently have participated in the past in the dinner in different ways, as well as the distinguished Machan Chem to my right, who have participated. So it's a really important event, and we encourage everybody to join us and participate in any way, if at all possible. So our program tonight is, this is technically part two of the series, but if you weren't in part one, that's totally all good. And we're focusing on how to inspire ourselves and educate our children when it comes to tefillah. We are in the business of educating our children and focusing on tefillah. So the way we're going to frame it tonight is that the Kolil and Ahilo Torinari Crown sent out an email and we solicited feedback, questions from members of the community as they relate to davening. So I printed out uh, what we received in this Google document, thanks to the great technology that we have today. And what we're just going to do, the format of the evening, is we're going to go right to it. We're going to go through this series of questions, and Rabbi Linzer and uh, Rabbi Samber will have a chance to chime in on each one of these questions over the course of the evening. And then we'll potentially open it up as well, but the focus is going to be on the case studies, these questions that we have at hand. Okay, let's get right to it. Uh, number one. My elementary school age son doesn't want to come to shul with me on Shabbos. Should I require him to come? How might I encourage him? So let's start with uh, Rabbi Linzer, and then we'll pass along to, to Rabbi Samber. Okay, thank you. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Rabbi Brand. And it's really wonderful to share a uh, program together with Rabbi Samber, wonderful colleague and, and good friend. Um, Question of tefillah. My elementary school age son does not want to come to shul uh, on Shabbos, so should I require him to come? That is a, I think many of us grapple in general uh, in Judaism and maybe particular in davening about, you know, the idea of forcing my, our children to do things. And I think the biggest fear is, am I going to turn them off? You know, I, I want them to do it. It's important, so I want, I'm going to force, I'm going to push, but I'm afraid if I push too hard, it's going to turn them off. So we don't really know what to do. If we push too hard, we're going to turn them off. If we don't push at all, they're not, they're not going to, you know, they're going to do whatever they want. They're not going to come. So I kind of, you know, that's why this, I think this is really, it's a good question to start with because I think it really has a lot of the ingredients for a lot of the other, um, you know, issues that I think might come up. One, one, one thing I want to stress, I guess, is that when it comes to this, is that the um, parent-child relationship is, of course, extremely important. I think throughout, when it comes to these questions of davening, we want to always maintain that. And I think parents today, we're, we're facing a particular challenge, is that it's been written about in many places, 
we're, we always want to try to be our children's friends. I'm speaking to myself as well here as a parent of young children. We want them to like us, want them, and we're, we always want to make them happy. And we're afraid of anything that's going to ruffle their feathers or anything that's going to maybe make them, you know, not like us or, you know, yell at us or throw a tantrum. And, uh, and I think almost, it's almost like we're afraid of them. And it's, of course, if you look at the Torah values and you look at Halacha, halacha keep it up aim, and the role of parents in the family, and it's written about, in, even in today's world, today's psychology, by a Harvard um, professor who wrote a, wrote a great book about the parents, called The Parents We Mean to Be. And his thesis is that really the source of children's moral development and for them to grow in their values is parental authority. And without parents asserting their authority, um, children will not gain the right kind of values that we're looking for them to gain. And he's speaking from a, you know, not necessarily a Torah perspective, although he's, he's Jewish and many of his, his works are, uh, you know, you could, you could see the Torah thoughts there, but he's really doing, coming from a purely research-based, and he proves this based on research. So I really think it's important for parents don't, not to be afraid to assert their authority, with children in, in any area of values, but in, in, and including areas of religion and areas of um, and areas of tefillah. So it's okay to force your child to do something. That's okay, and in fact, it's even good for them, and they need it. And deep down, they almost want that. Um, obviously, it's a balance, and you need to find the right line between pushing too hard, of course, and uh, and uh, and and you know giving up and giving them totally free reign. But developing those positive routines and that that chinuch of training them in in something like davening, even if they're too young to really appreciate davening in a deeper way, maybe that comes later in life. But all of chinuch is really training them with the right kind of routines. Remember to make a bracha. Remember to wash. I mean, we do this. You know, davening is, is no different. We shouldn't be afraid of pushing our kids a little bit when it comes to davening. So I'm going to leave it with that. And I'll ask Rabbi Samba to fill in some more thoughts on this one. Um, so I kind of just carrying some of the ideas that Rabbi Linzer said, but just maybe filling in a couple of things. The question, and all the all questions are always. No, it's a little bit loaded because you know exactly what you're dealing with. So I think the first thing when we're talking about, and let's start with age of the child that we're talking about, elementary school is pretty broad range. Um, you have to start by knowing your ch that child. You have to know that child. If the person who's asking the question, and that could be any of us, so I'm not standing up on a pedestal here, but if the person asking that question is first really beginning their relationship of understanding their child in this one specific case, then this is really an impossible question to answer. With the assumption that the question is being asked by somebody who is understanding their child, understanding their child. So if they're asking the question about requiring the child to come to shul, then clearly we're talking about a child that isn't jumping at it. Um, is it running out the door with, with daddy to go to shul? And so the question that the parent, father or mother, has to ask themselves is, why? You know, what is, what's going on? And, and that starts with the dialogue. There's no child that's really too young. I think it's in a, probably one of the most important um, yesodos that a parent needs to know is that they have to have a dialogue with their child. Particularly when we're talking about Mitzvos and, and educating them in mitzvos, benadol l'makom. Benadol l'chaver is kind of a, you know, we're not gonna have a dialogue as to why you can't punch your sister. Um, you just can't and you don't understand that. That's just not gonna happen in my house. But on, or speaking disrespectfully to mommy or daddy or something like that. We're, but in the realm of benadol l'makom, when we're trying to educate our children in that all important sensitive area of developing a relationship with Hashem, Dialogue is an exceedingly important thing. And talking about what it is that is keeping them from jumping to go to shul. Is it that they're bored? Is it that they're angry? Is it because they don't like the fact they're being asked to say things that to them is Chinese and might as well be Chinese? What is it? What is it? And that, if you can't, if you don't have that relationship with your child to have the dialogue with them, that's a very question to answer. I don't even know how to answer that question. But if you do have that dialogue and you have that relationship, which is an extremely important thing, 
So then the answer is, do I require my child to go, would really depend on, well, what's the conversation? What are you hearing from them? As a general rule, while I agree with Earl Linzer, there's definitely um, exercising your authority as a parent and is, is, is important and, and sometimes really what the child is begging for. Uh, but treading very, very lightly when it comes to requiring, particularly when you come to davening. Davening is an avoid the shivalev. It's what is taking place in a relationship in someone's heart. To force someone into davening is not necessarily a recipe for success. So I think I would stop short of saying requiring a child to go to davening, but really taking the time to make it as attractive for him or her to want to go to shul. And I would pretty much stop there. I, don't, I would stop short of saying you have to go to shul. Uh, that's to me treading on some very thin ice and I, I just personally wouldn't go there. One question, I guess, just as a follow-up or maybe an observation, one thing to think about, um, a conversation that I had with someone about these issues, is that perhaps one way of looking at this is not necessarily requiring in terms of coercion, but uh, one way of looking at it might be for us to consider having to do with the word expectation. Because sometimes it becomes, well, my friend doesn't go and my neighbor doesn't go, so why am I going? So in, if it's more about, well, the expectation in our house or the way our family does things is that at such and such an age, this is what we do. The same way we do a lot of other things that you like in our house, so we also do this. Mm -hmm. So then it becomes a different kind of conversation than saying, you must go, this is a requirement, or this is some kind of mandatory thing. So it's another way of framing it that might Definitely. be helpful. Definitely. Um, and the next question. My eighth grade daughter arrives at Downing on time, but barely says any of the words the entire time. And when she does, she simply speeds through them. What should I do? Sandra, you want to start with that one? Oh, okay. Um, I guess part of this is really a repetition. Um, but each one of these questions have a little bit of a different nuance to it. I would assume the question is kind of like, what do I do, meaning what can I do to inspire her to be different, or what can I do as far as should I say something to her? Uh, I think it starts with um, one of the reasons that, that people, myself included, struggle with tefillah, and an eighth grade girl would be no different, is um, sort of, there, there's a number of reasons why people struggle. One of them is I don't really value what I'm doing. It's a, there's a lack of appreciation for what we're really accomplishing. We live in a generation that's very all or nothing. You know, I'm either an A plus honor roll or not really worthy of being mentioned. Um, and then we apply that to all sorts of things. We do this for ourselves. So we get very, what am I really doing? I'm speeding through davening because, you know, it's not really, I think we have to be able to slow things down, bring things down to a level where can we appreciate the little things? Can we really appreciate the value of what's going on when a person stands in front of a Kaddish Baruch Hu and even is able to show up to Shul? And they don't say anything. Forget about it. Even if they didn't say anything, but they just showed up to Shul. That's, a, that's, that's, that's huge. Now, there's a, there's a, the Gemara says, um, famous Gemara, the Gemara says that there was a, uh, a king, Meroidach Beladon, and uh, he um, wanted to send, he was a, the king, and, and he wanted to send a, a letter of, of, um, of peace to Chizkiyo Amela. Chizkiyo had a, was very, very sick and had a, refua, a miraculous refua. Um, he wanted to send a letter to him, so he had a scribe write a letter to Chizkiyo, and if I remember the Gemara correctly, um, the, it was it titled. He started out the, the the greeting of the of the letter as greeting to um, greeting to uh, the, the great Chizkiyo, greeting to the to, who li to greeting to the holy city of, of Jerusalem, greeting to the, the great God great God of Israel. And some scribes sent wrote it up, and they sent it out. And Sancheir was at that time was excuse me, Nebuchadnezzar was um, was was one of the scribes 
for this Muraydach Baladan. And he wasn't there at the time that the letter was written. So when he walked in and he heard what's going on, there's a letter being sent to Chizkiyahu HaMelech. And he says, really, what, what was written in there? And he heard that the order of which it was written, Chizkiyahu, Yerushalayim, and then Hashem. And the Gemara says that he took three steps, four steps, depends on which gear so you want, three or four steps to go stop this scribe because it's a lack of respect to Hashem. Lack of respect to Hashem that you would put Hashem third. And so he took three or four steps, and the Malach had to stop him, because for every step that he took, the Gemara says he was, he was given a reward by Hashem that he, would, he and his children would have generations of being rulers over Klai Yisrael, rulers over, over his nation, and which would end up destroying Klai Yisrael. He had an unbelievable reward. And the Marsha over there says that the three steps that we take at the end of the Avenue back uh, which we finish Shmona Esrei with the Yiratzen, Sheyibana Beis HaMikdash Bimheir V'yameinu. So the Marsha says, why are we saying at the end of Shmona Esrei, Yiratzen, Sheyibana Beis HaMikdash Bimheir V'yameinu? Says the Marsha, the three steps that we take back in honor of God, that's to, course, that's to correspond to the three steps that, that Nebuchadnezzar took in honor of Hashem. And he received his reward, which he was able to destroy the Beis HaMikdash with that. We are able to get a reward for honoring Hashem. Point being, what did he do? He took a step, an unbelievable reward, a tremendous reward that he received. He took a step in honoring Hashem. If we were able to communicate to our children, communicate to ourselves first and then to our children. You know, eighth grade girl, sweetheart, look what you're doing, unbelievable. You showed up to Shul, you walked into Shul, you opened the sitter, you said a few words, that's unbelievable. It's unreal. Do you understand the reward? That, do you understand how much Hashem loves to hear that from you? I just think that the approach has to be to build. And the rest should follow. And under normal circumstances, when a person starts to appreciate what they're doing, the rest would follow. To add a little bit to that, I think sometimes um, the question is talking about girls, and, uh, but I think the truth is it applies to boys as well. Um, in school, uh, in schools in general, kids learn to daven, right? And they learn a little bit uh, over the years. Um, and then when they get a little older, they're already saying the whole davening. Um, most schools, the kids don't really learn the Shabbos davening. And that's usually, it's one of those like black holes. Like it, it just sort of falls between the cracks because, you know, in school, it's, it's not Shabbos. So why, we're not going to daven the whole Shabbos davening on a Tuesday. But, and at home, it's like, you, parents aren't, don't think I have to teach my kid to daven. They'll go to shul, they'll open up there. Of course they know how to daven. I sent to yeshiva, sure, they should know how to daven. But somewhere along the way, the kid is caught in the middle. So it could be if there's this particular person, I don't know the exact scenario, but it could be the girl literally just doesn't know what to do for the Shabbos davening, you know? And, and especially maybe she comes, it's Pesuke Zimra, and it's very different than what she's used to during the week, or it's a different part of the davening. Maybe she doesn't, you know, the, the, the parts that are special to Shabbos, and she's a little confused. So sometimes the problem doesn't always have such a complicated solution, and maybe it's just, just lack of knowledge. And maybe it's a question of, you know, opening up and, and learning, as Rabbi Samber said, one step at a time, and it's one paragraph at a time. You know, we have a very long age-old tradition, the Shulchan Aruch tells us, Tov ma'at bechavana me'asher harbe bli chavana. It's better to say much less with kavana than to say more without kavana. It's, it's a real halacha. It's not just, you know, uh, something you tell little kids. It's a halacha for adults too, actually. Rabbi Shechter, I, I heard once speak about tefillin, he would talk about how he himself, the davening in the white based marriage was too fast for him. If anyone's ever done white based marriage, it's really slow. But he felt it was too fast for him. And he couldn't say the whole tachnun. So he would like rotate every day of the week. He would say a different, every Monday, Thursday, he would say a different paragraph because they went too fast. So he himself did, didn't say the whole sitter, didn't say the whole davening because it was too fast. So Kabbalah applies to us as well. And Kabbalah to an eighth grade girl. Um, going, to, going to Shalom Shabbos who maybe doesn't know all the psukhet zimra and doesn't know all the, all the different pieces. That, that's uh, perhaps a perspective, you know, for, for kids, for kids uh, in general and, and kids that age when it comes to Shabbos davening. Okay, thank you. Okay, number three. My seventh grade son is bored during Shabbos davening in shul. What should I do? 
no, that's only this kid, right? <laughs> it doesn't apply to adults either, I'm sure. Especially not the people here, um, or the people sitting at this table. Um, truth is, shul, as I Sam alluded to before, shul can be long, especially Shabbos morning, and, and it can be long for kids, and it certainly can be long for us as well, for adults. Um, I think especially it's gotten worse in today's day and age for all of us, for our kids, but even for us with constantly attached to our devices and we live in a very fast paced world with a lot of stimulation and to actually sit for two to three hours, you know, without any, any immediate stimulation and, and feel like you don't, it's not, even though it is a dialogue with Hashem, you don't necessarily hear the other side in the same kind of way as you do in a video game. Um, it, it could definitely be a challenge. I think it's, in a way, it's precisely because it's such a challenge, it's in a way all the, all the more important that, that we use it as an opportunity to develop different skills with, uh, with our children and truthfully with ourselves as well. Um, it's, a, it's very important for, um, I, I would say, one, well, two things. Number one, Shul could be a, um, in terms of this, I had a friend who once told me that when he Again, the story of the white based medrash. So you're davening and you finish, and then you're waiting for the chazan to start. And sometimes you're waiting a while between your personal shmonesri when the chazan starts. And he, this friend, he said he used to spend, this was at Marib, and he used to spend that time to actually review his day and to think, what did I do today? And how was my day? And what choices I made? And whatever it was. And I always found that very inspiring. And you know, sometimes when we have a free moment to actually, there's nothing else going on, there's no stimulation, we're not talking to anyone. What does it mean to actually think a little bit? And I think, as, as, as you said before, about having a dialogue with our children and talking to them and saying, you know what? Yeah, Shul sometimes is long. Maybe it's long for me, too. Um, you know, what, what could we do and brainstorm? What, what are some ideas that we could do when, when something's taking a long time and, and I don't have what else to do? What are some ways we could use that time? And, and I think it's important to also validate those, those feelings. One thing I would say, um, I've noticed that sometimes people bring other things to shul to entertain kids. I don't know about seventh grade, but maybe even maybe younger ages, you see it a lot. Games or, you know, it depends, of course, on the age or books. Um, and, and to me, as the kids gets older, I think it's just important to us to think what, what we're bringing and what message does that send. So if a kid's reading Harry Potter and they're at the appropriate age where they, they should be more participating in what's going on in shul, and they're sitting there, you know, holding up the, the Harry Potter and them in the middle of the row, you know, that's kind of a message to the kids that, okay, shul's really not important, and, and maybe it's better if that kid's gonna do it, maybe it's better for them not to be in shul already at that point, you know, but it's, you're basically training them to do other things in shul because the shul's boring. I mean, if, if one is gonna, you know, bring something to look at, it could be a chumash, it could be the, the art school shul chumash, maybe it's a rashi in English or something, you know, maybe during the in-between the laning or something. But I think we need to think carefully, when they're little kids we bring toys, but as they get older, developmentally, when do we start shifting that strategy? And the same thing I think applies to the groups as well, and we've talked about it a lot. You know, we, we send, our, it's a little different question, we send our kids out to groups, at which point is the right age to start bringing them back into shul gradually for different parts of davening? Maybe come in for 20 minutes, you know, and then you can be in the groups. Or maybe, you know, come for this, psukhidism, or maybe come for a few aliyahs, you know. But, but it should be developmentally appropriate, it should be gradual, and it should really be, be done with a dialogue with, uh, with the child, validating their feelings and talking together about what to do. Uh, I, I, this is a, uh, how do they do it at, this, at the meetings? They know, hi, my name is Ellie Samper, I am a, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I have adult onset ADD, and, and uh, Shul is challenging for me as well. I, I try to avoid Vignana that lasts more than an hour, 45 minutes. Um, two hours max. I, I think the answer to the question is, you have to be real. You have to be real. A seventh grade boy today, seventh grade boy, to be able to. You have to ask yourself. Parents will sometimes say to me, I'm worried about my kid because they're not into davening. Quite honestly, I'm worried about the kid who's into davening. Because you have to ask yourself, why would a 12 year old boy, for example, a seventh grade boy, be into davening? Um, there, there are some good answers for it, which are not cause for concern. And that is, um, they really want to make their parents proud. Um, 
they want something really special for their birthday, so they, they want it in the oven. Um, I don't know, maybe want their, their brother to go away. You know, I, I, there's, there's good answers for why a seventh grade boy might be motivated to doubt. Sometimes it's concerning um, why they were all be so all of a sudden, and then you find out there's somebody that's very sick in their house. Um, that's why all of a sudden they're very into davening. Um, you know, dad might be really strongly forcing him to be sitting in shul and paying attention and looking inside. It's, when you think about it, it's really understandable for them to be bored in, in shul. It really is. It's, they don't really know what they're saying, which is obviously something that could be worked on over, over time to work on understanding more. Don't really know what they're saying. Don't really appreciate the depth of what tefillah is at this age. Unf yeah, un I say unfortunately, or just reality as adults, the older we get, that's when tefillah becomes much more meaningful to us, because we have a lot more to, we realize how fragile we are. We realize how much we need Hashem for. And I think that the key with, is, like Herbert Linzer said, validating this young man, that it isn't easy. It's a, it's a navayda, it's a work. And if, you know, really work talking with him about realistic expectations, how long can you stay in show? How long can you be motivated to, to try to focus on what's going on? And when you get to that point where you feel it's really hard, try a little bit more. You know, push yourself a little bit, but not too much. Not too much, and it's okay. It's okay. Don't go outside of show and start running around like a, you know, like a crazy person. But I just really believe that our understanding of why it's challenging, it's very normal. It's really very normal for a seventh grader to feel that it's very hard. Really very, very hard. Skip three, I want to go to four. <clears throat> How can I educate my child in davening if people around me in shul are talking? So you're going first, I got that one first. I can't understand the question. <laughs> <laughs> Never heard of such a thing. Uh, were, um, it's an out-of-town person who wrote in the question. Must be a different city. Yeah, somewhere. Uh, yeah, it's, from, it's from New York. Oh, it only happens in New York. Topeka. Topeka. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, boy. Hopefully it's not the father or mother that's doing the talking, because then that question becomes much more difficult to understand, to, to explain. Uh, you know, at the, at the root of this question is, is educating our children on not being judgmental. Don't be judgmental. Okay, person's talk, it's not right. That's true, it isn't right to talk during happening. But don't be judgmental of that person, and it's very difficult, just, you know, just like the last question. You're bored? Yeah, you're bored too. And um, it's a whole conversation about just not t training our children not to look at others in a judgmental way, while that doesn't stop us from saying there's an appropriate way of being in shul and davening, not talking. Not talking the same way that if you see somebody who's davening with, um, I don't know, quickly, very fast from one essay, Super fashion one, that's right. One of those lightning ones, which you just know it's not possible to say every word. It's just, it's just not humanly possible. Um, okay. Don't judge that person. Same thing is true when it comes to talking and shul. We have a way of, here's the halacha, open up, you want to learn with your child, here's the shulchan aruch. It's not musr. There's a halacha that says you don't talk direction. And that's what we do. And the fact that not everybody is always able to live up to the standard there are people speak Lashon Hara when they shouldn't speak Lashon Hara. There's people that are as careful with Shabbos as they should be. There's, it, it doesn't stop or end with talking during Shul. We keep Shabbos despite the fact that some people have a hard time with Shabbos. And with davening, it's no different. I totally agree. Um, to add, there's a, uh, a quote from Rav Cook. I actually have it hanging on the wall in my office um, where he, he speaks about when we see things in the world that maybe aren't so good, you know, what, what's our, we, we have two choices usually. And we can either complain about it and talk about how bad it is, or we can actually do something to, to help. So he says, tzadikim atahorim enem kovlim ala risha. They don't complain. Pure tzadikim don't complain about wickedness. 
Rather, mosifim tzedek, they add righteousness to the world. In kovlo melha kfira, they don't complain about people who are non-believers. Ela mosifim emuna, they add emuna to the world, etc., etc. So I think the, the same, uh, same uh, along the lines of Rabbi Samber, it's a teachable moment uh, for our children. And the uh, full else fails, you can always move your seat, uh, usually in the front of the shul, a little bit less of a problem than the back. <laughs> no, I want to say one more thing. You know, I, I, just to add one other idea, it's really, it's, it's about this, but it, it could be about other things as well uh, when it comes to tefillah. One area which, for me personally, is a struggle, and again, that's why I'm just, I'm just tr- this is transference going on, but an area that makes tefillah something very difficult is that we're, we tend to be, uh, get down on ourselves. But we can go into Shmona Esther and say, okay, this is it. This is going to be the one. I'm going to have Kavana. I'm going to dive in properly. And, you know, before you realize it, you know, you're waking up because you're smacking yourself in the chest and you don't even know how you got there. Um, and then you get the motive and then the three steps back and you say, okay, I blew it. I blew it. Uh, what tends to happen is we catch ourselves in the middle of Shmona Esther and we blew it and we get down on ourselves. So um, I want to just connect this to the idea of talking during davening as well. There's, I once heard a report, this made a very big impression on me when it comes to working on my davening. Uh, a Rebbe of mine in Neri Shul, in, in high school, of Kama Wine Rib, this, the Pasuk says, the Pasuk says, that they see Yaakov in Be'er Sheva, Be'er Lecharona. Yaakov left Be'er Sheva, he went to Charon, Be'er Sheva, and he came to the Makom Yerushalayim. Rashi has his way of answering this theory, but the Gemara asks the question. The Gemara says, well, how can it be in Haran and in Yerushalayim at the same time? It says, Vayel Haran, he went to Haran, and it says, Vayel Haran, he was in Yerushalayim. You know, how can he do that? So the Gemara answers a famous story that Yaakov passed Yerushalayim. He passed Yerushalayim, he got to Haran, and he said, smacked himself in the head, and he said, I can't believe it, I just passed Yerushalayim, I just passed Yerushalayim, the place where my, oh, the, my, my father, my father, my grandfather, they davened, and I didn't daven. I messed up. And he decided to go back to Yerushalayim. He had passed it, he was already in the and he decided to go back to Yerushalayim. And he had a tremendous nays happen to him, he had kvitsa zadera, and he was in boom, he was in Yerushalayim, instantly. So that's how the Gemara reconciles the contradiction. He was in Haran, and he was in Shalim, because it happened instantly. So my Rebbe said, why was he, first, what's the Torah teaching us, and why was Yaakov Zeche to a nace of that proportion? Kvitsa Sadara. So you see from here, we're being taught something very fantastic. When a person messes up, a person messes up, and they acknowledge they mess up, and they try to do better. Yaakov messed up. I hate to say that about the others, but he messed up. He blew it. He's like in the middle of Shmon Esther. He woke up. He says, well, "What was I do? My where was my mind?" And a person decides, "I'm going to try to do better." They're they're zayfa to the type of siyanta deshmaya that they wouldn't have had had they not messed up. Nisan, tremendous nisan. The acknowledgement of your human frailty and your willingness to any way try brings about a tremendous amount of siyata d'shemayim. When a person catches himself in the middle of Shmon Esrei and they realize, I haven't had kavana up until this point, I've been thinking about what I'm making for supper tonight. And they catch themselves and they say, you know what, I've only got one bracha left in Shmon Esrei. I'm going to try. The siyata d'shemayim that a person can have in that one bracha is unbelievable. The same thing when it comes to talking in shul. Person could be talking, you could tell your child. You see that person talking, it's not right. You can be the role model that can inspire that person by you davening like a mensch, by, like, by you davening the way a person's supposed to dive. And they'll see you and they'll be inspired to not talk for the last five minutes of davening. Because they, you know what, at the end of the day, they see this kid who's davening like a mensch and they say, I'm gonna. You can create for that person unbelievable siyata deshmaya by just being a role model of what it means to not talk. I, the guy talked the whole first, so what, you messed up. That doesn't mean you can't accomplish amazing things after messing up. To me, that was something that I, 
It's just very meaningful. I try to remind myself every time that I mess up, which is pretty much every day. How can I model davening for my child if I don't know much about it myself? Davening is one of those things, areas of Judaism, that's so infinitely deep, you know, as opposed to other mitzvos, taking a lulav, you know, you, definitely there are deeper kavanos there, but you pick up the lulav, you did it. When it comes to davening, as Rabbi Samberg just so eloqu eloquently described, you know, it, it's, we're so distracted, and, and we, we, none of us, you know, at least speaking for myself, you know, focus the way we think we should. And uh, it's really an avodah of a lave. It's really something that, that comes from the heart and requires, uh, y there's so many levels of tefillah. So uh, someone, the, the parent who's asking, if I don't know much about it myself, I think that applies to everyone. You know, everyone has to face that struggle. And I, I would explain to that parent that, uh, you know, there's so many levels of davening. And it's not just a question of knowing what the sitter says. There's plenty of siddurim in English, etc. It's really more about where you're at is, so many stories that we all have heard of Baal Shem Tov and, and early Hasidim about the shepherd who's saying the Aleph Beis and his tefillah is better than, you know, the Rebbe. Um, because it's not about just the words you're saying, it's where it's coming from and the, depth, the depths of the emotional place where you're at and how much you're needing and connecting, whether it's an area of need or whether it's a hoda, thanking Hashem for something in, in one's life. So I would explain that as well. And there are also so many opportunities to learn more about davening. There's a great, I actually brought it here, there's a great uh, sitter that I would recommend. It's called, it's the Koran, they have many versions. It's called Anit Fila. And this was written, the, the, the commentary was put together by a colleague and a mentor of mine, Rabbi Dr. Jay Goldmans. And it's really intended for teenagers, truthfully. That's like the kind of direct audience. But it's, it's great for adults, too. I, I read through the whole thing, and it's phenomenal. He has a little section about Kavana, but about every part of the davening. He has a personal, he has a story, he has a halachic insight, he has uh, some words insight. It's like four or five different types of commentaries within this. Um, it's a great, it's, and it has the davening itself, so while you're in shul, you could also be looking at it. And there's so, so, so many sources like that to grow. I think in terms of the parents wanting, feeling inadequate, I would say the main thing for the parent, though, is that if the parent models it and they just make time for davening, whether it's at home, it's good for kids to see parents davening at home, and it's also good for kids to see parents going to shul, so both, I would say, and, uh, and just the fact that the child sees the parent is trying to learn, is doing the best they can, even if we have many parents who didn't go to day school, didn't grow up you know, with that kind of background, that's okay. If they see that the parent's taking it seriously, that's gonna make a very strong impression. Uh, on the child, and they will always remember that davening is a priority for, for their parents. What was the question again? The, uh, how can I model it model if it? I don't know it myself? Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, yeah, I, Rabbi, what Rabbi Linder said it just so resonates with me and so, on so many levels. Um, I think we have to get to the most basic concept of what Tefillah is about. Tefillah is about our relationship with Hashem. So we don't have to know, we don't have to know depths of tefillah, we don't have to know deep sodos and the Ramazim and the Anshikness Sagdila. Those are beautiful things and lofty goals to, to achieve and growing in those things. But what we could do for our children, the single greatest preparation that, that you can do for your child when it comes to tefillah is helping them develop that type of relationship with Hashem where they can just talk to Hashem. Talking to talking to Hashem. What a, what a gift, what a gift to be, you don't, you don't have to have a day school education. When you're looking for that parking space downtown and you say, God, please bring me a parking space. Please, please, I, I do not want to park in the garage and pay 40 bucks, please give me a parking space. You are teaching your children Tila. You are teaching your children Tila. When you have a good, when you come home at the end of a work day and you say, you know, I say, I'm, you walk in the door and your children hear you say, thank you, Hashem, that I have a, a warm home to walk into and, and food in my refrigerator. You're just teaching the basics of tefillah. When a person is in pain, to turn to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, doesn't have to be, I'm not talking about catastrophic pain. You drop the bowling ball on your toe and you say, you know, 
instead of something else that would come out of your mouth, you say, you say, <coughs> this pain, please, if you, you know, if you, what you could do to remove this pain from it. Your children grow up with that. You're modeling tefillah. You're modeling the, the, the foundation of tefillah. And um, you don't need to be a scholar to do that at all. Just to add, someone shared with me recently a strange anecdote, a strange mashal. I thought at first it was so weird, and then I was like, you know, it's really very profound. Uh, there were two Jews, two men sitting in shul, <clears throat> and they both, each one of them had a son. One was a Chassidish Yid, and the other one was a very, let's say, austere Lithuanian Jew. So they're sitting there on the bench in shul, and they're davening. And the Litvak is sitting there, and the entire time he's looking at his kid and he's saying to him, sit down and down, sit down and down, be quiet and down, be quiet and down. And the other guy, Chassidish Yid, is on the next bench, is sitting there, and he's looking up, and he's gesticulating, and he's davening, and, he's, and his kid is, ru- is running around like a vildachaya. He's running all over the place, he's standing on the set, he's crawling on the bench, he's crawling under the bench, he's drag- grabbing the talus, he's playing around. So finally, the, uh, the Litvak, after davening, he's so frustrated, he's driving him nuts, finally comes over to this guy and says, do you see what is going on with your kid in this shul? Do you see what he's doing? So the Chaz says, look, I'm trying to be machanik my child. In 20 years, your child is going to be sitting on the bench telling his kid, be quiet, sit down and down, and be quiet, sit down and down. My kid, hopefully, will sit down and down. <laughs> so sometimes it's not about telling the kids to sit down and down, and just davening ourselves will hopefully plant those seeds. And another observation that we're hearing that I think is worth um, just expanding on just for a second is part of the challenge is something that both Rabbi Linzer and Rabbi Samber are articulating that on the one hand the whole notion of davening is this it's an experience it's not something that's cerebral it's not intellectual it's an emotional experiential activity of standing before the Rabbani Shalom and that's <clears throat> that's amazing it's it's massive the Rabbani who created the world we're talking to him and yet on the other hand, we have so many shortcomings, we have so many struggles in davening, so then it's like, you know, we, we have this disparity that on the one hand, davening is supposed to be amazing, and we have this vision in our mind of how davening is supposed to be incredible, and yet at the end of the day, so much of our davening is so lacking. So, there's one teaching, a very powerful teaching that I was introduced to by Rabbi Moshe Weinberger, who's the Mashbiya now in YU. So he pointed out a piece from the Tzidka Tzadik, from the Helika, or Tzadik HaKohen of Lublin, and Rabbi Tzadik says, that just like a person has to believe in the Rabbana Shalom, Kashim Shitzarf Lahamin Bashem Isbarach, Kach Tzarf Lahamin Ba'atzmo. A person has to believe in themselves. So we need, I think, we, we need to be, as both of you alluded to, we need to be honest with our children about that struggle. That on the one hand, the godless Sa'adam, the ability to us, that's given to us to talk to Hashem. But, and on the other hand, the challenges that we face, and it doesn't mean we should throw in the towel the opportunity to rabo emunasech Hashem as emunanas, that's the way to start our day. How can we ensure that tefillah will be an ever-growing process with regular elevation and deeper feelings? It's a grammatical and change, that wasn't exactly the right. question is for ourselves, or for our children? That was the question. Okay. Uh, All right. I'll, I'll just refer it as to ourselves. Um, the children, I think, will follow. How will we ensure? I don't think there's any guarantees, no ensuring, um, but I, I think that we have to create we just have to, we have to create an enthusiasm for davening. It's a it's it's a lifelong work, but we have to we have to start somewhere, and you have to create a passion and an enthusiasm. A passion and enthusiasm, if it, if it's there, will grow. It will grow. Um, I think women are not guilty of this at all. The following example: so all the women in the room, and of course not all men, but. The men will, I'm sure, at least know what I'm talking about. More damage is done when there is a uh, surprise announcement in Shul 
there's a there's a press. No Tafman. No Tafman. The euphoria. The euphoria. You would think you would literally think that the, the, the who knows what was just announced. We just saved three minutes of davening. I, I mean, no tachon. Just stop and ask. You know, what what is the what is the message? What are we telling? What are we showing? What are we showing our children? We're talking about children. There's children. I've been in shows where where kids will will look at their their parents who are fist bumping, high fiving that there's no tachon. <laughs> This is, the, you know, this is where it starts. We, we, we have to look in the mirror and have to say, do we value what we're doing? If we value it, the passion will grow. It'll be ever growing. If it's just a checklist that we are going to show up to show and we're going to say, okay, chakras, check, done, let me move on. It won't, of course not. It's not, it's, it's not going to. So it starts there. It starts there. Once you know, we're hearing from uh, Rabbi Yaakov Horowitz, who's a, a famous principal in Muncie and Project Yes, and uh, educator par excellence, fantastic. I recommend him highly to anybody who wants to hear tremendous things on Chinuch. So he said he, he worked with children who, were, who struggled um, with their observance and what is referred to commonly as off the derech kids. So he, he asked a child once, um, not a child, a teenager, who had Baruch Hashem come back. He said, what was it that, that pushed you off? What was it that pushed you off? He said, I'll tell you exactly what it was. He said, my father used to sit by the dining room table and he would learn all the time. And he would, he would learn all the time and he would make me learn. And then it was time for shoal, he would take me to shoal and he would make me go to shoal. And one day we were on our way back from shoal and the next door neighbor, we passed the next door neighbor's driveway and there was a brand new Volvo in the, in the driveway. My father looked at that Volvo and he was like, wow, that's a nice car. He said, I looked at my father, I had never seen him enthusiastic about anything like that before. Not the davening, not the learning. But the Volvo, that, that he was just, that was super exciting for him. We have to just look in the mirror and ask ourselves, are we enthusiastic about it? Do we value it? And if the answer is not to the level that it should be, focusing on that, and ironically, davening for Siyat Dishmaya, that we should have that, is the key to having a lifelong of growing in appreciation for tefillah. And by extension for our children. That's, that's the gift that we can give our children. If we become enthusiastic about it, they'll be enthusiastic about it. I, I, you don't have to look farther than, than, I use this as an example, baseball. Think about it. I mean, I love playing baseball, watching baseball. Painful. It's painful. The Wall Street Journal did a study. How much of a three-hour baseball game, how much of that time is there actual action taking place? Somebody went from the Wall Street Journal with a stopwatch, and he clicked it only when there was action. Not when anybody's like spitting or scratching. No, that's not action. Talking about like actual action. Can you take a guess how long is action taking place? 13 minutes. 13 minutes of a three hour baseball game. And yet you've got kids who are passionate baseball fans. Where do they, are they crazy? No, the answer is their parents are passionate and other people are passionate. So the passion extends to them and they pick it up and they're enthusiastic and the rest is history and they pass it on to the next generation. It's no different. If we can become passionate about it, we can pass it on. And that's the key. I, uh, I have to agree with that, um, certainly. It's a Mets fan. Although They're I do Mets like fans. baseball. It's a Mets fan. Playoffs is different. Um, I, I think one of the real challenges that we all have, and definitely myself included very much so, is you know our lives are so busy in today's day and age. I think everyone's lives are very busy with family, with jobs. And, and I think our devices make our lives even more busy because we're in touch all the time. There's email, there's texting, there's WhatsApp, there's you know, news. Um, and I think it's very hard for us to create the space for davening. So that means two things. Number one, actually the time in the day, it's very hard. Sometimes mincha is like a two minute slot for that because we're rushing between a meeting or something else. So it's actually just making sure there's time 
that we can have, which is not always easy, and, uh, and then really more the mental space, sort of, you know, the whole idea of the davening, the Hasidim HaRishonim, the Gemara says we'd spend an hour trying to focus before davening. You know, we're lucky if we spend like a half a second, if that, trying to focus. And um, I, think, I think that's a real challenge. So the, I think the more, uh, I know for me, that's something I, I know I need to work on, and uh, perhaps, perhaps there's some potential there for uh, growing in our davening in the future if we were able to create the space for it. I think maybe in closing, the words ever-growing really apply to the topic of davening in that we always need to work on developing our relationship with the Rabboni Shalom and to work on our davening. We look around the room, we see people who have, um, I don't want to say more years than all of us combined davening, but more years than us uh, with experience in davening. And we look to people who came before us who have modeled davening for us, and we look to the Svar Makadoshim and the traditions that have been passed down to us, but recognizing that it is a lifelong journey. And that, I don't know, is it ever possible to say that a person has reached the pinnacle, the ultimate, in the experience of davening? Maybe Moshe Rabbeinu stood at Har Sinai for 40 days, so then he could say, you know, he got it right. And then even then, the Rabbi Shalom said to him at some point, you know, I'm not interested so much in your davening, we figure something else out. I think the idea that we all came together tonight to focus on how we can address our growth in davening, how we can pass that on to our children, to the members of our community, even if they're not our biological children, but whether we have our own children or our own children are not at home, there are other children in the community who are looking at us, who are looking to be inspired by us. So whatever role we play in the life of a child somewhere, we can help them in their lifelong pursuit of growth in their avodas Hashem. So I thank... I want to say one thing. Oh, oh, I apologize. Yeah. Uh, I, I really, apologize. You have two more minutes. Yeah, I just want to... I want to... There's just a, a, a couple of things that I, I would recommend if you have the opportunity to do them. Just concrete, like really practical things. Um, one is a shift of language. Instead of when you're, when you're at home, you're in front of your kids or, or, or grandchildren or great-grandchildren, whatever they may be, even just changing the language from I have to go daven to I want to go daven, it's a nuance that is, it can be very powerful. Instead of running out the door and saying, I have to catch a minion. That's true, you do have to catch that minion, but I want to send such a, a more powerful message. Um, someone taught me this one, and it really, uh, I've advised some people, and they've come back and given me amazing results from it. The next time you're planning a family vacation, sit down with your family, sit down with your children, <coughs> and map it out. Where are we going to Davin Shabbos? Where are we going to Mecha? Are we going to make it to Cleveland in time to Davin Marv? Where are we going to Davin Marv? Where do you want to Davin Marv? Just introducing that into, so you're not just discussing which theme park are you going to, and where are we going to, where are we going to eat supper, which kosher restaurant are we going to go to, but where are we going to be davening? It's, it's such a strong, and even if it's not a family vacation, you know, looking around the room, I see certain people here that I know that they travel on business a ton. They travel on business a ton. Can you imagine having that conversation with your, with, with your child, son, daughter, either one, saying, Wow, I'm gonna be traveling. I'm going to LA. I'm flying. The, I'm, I've got this. I got this flight. Do you think I can make Shabbos in, in uh, on time? Because I really don't want to miss a minion. I really don't want to miss a minion. And not because like a little person's you know saying Kaddish. I just don't want to miss a minion. These types of things, if a person builds it into their conversation with their children, has such a powerful from a kumbase the positive things. The negative things, we all know the negative things we should avoid. They're, they're, everybody's Achilles heel. And it's become, a, it's become an epidemic lately. I, I watch how many people um, you know, leave davening early. You have to ask, where, what, is it really that much of a rush that you can't wait the three minutes at the end of davening, or the five minutes at the end of davening? These types of things, those negatives, we all know to avoid the negatives, but there's opportunities for positives that you could really have a major impact. And um, I wish all of us that's luck. I'm humbled, really. I want to finish by just saying I'm humbled at the audience. 
I know so many of you, if not all of you, and you're inspiring. Your, your, just your, your own personal growth and, and your advice of sharing. And uh, I appreciate that you are, are here tonight. So I'll echo that and thanking everyone for coming. Thank you for being a part of uh, our COLA and our community of learning. Thank you to Ortora again. And Amir Tzashem, we look forward to continuing our growth as a community in davening and all of the Aravod Hashem. So thank you. And in the spirit of davening, Marev will be taking place in the base of Medrash down the hall. I, 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 I want to daven Marev now. That's right. <laughs>